G doing looking at GCSE biology topic by topic and we're going to look at the story of preventing infections. Now this is quite an interesting story about how people started to take what we take for granted and how they sort of discovered things. It seems quite amazing that go back only about 150 years people had very little idea about viruses and bacteria and it didn't occur to them that these things were even in existence and it's only due to the work of several great doctors that we discovered quite a lot of these things about what we now term microbiology. Let's go in and have a look at some of these things and see what we can discover. So let's just zoom in and we'll have a look. Right, so there's quite a few people who've done various things, but we'll start with looking at a gentleman called Ignaz Semmelweis. So let's have a, a quick look and there we are, there's a, a picture of the bloke. Right, so he was a doctor in the mid-1850s and at that time many hospitals were the place where women would go to when they were expecting an, uh, a child and what happened was it was well known that many of them died from what was called to quote the words childbed fever and they died usually within a few days now what was going on and what caused it well if we take a little look at what we had we had usually a hospital we'll, we'll draw it a nice little hospital and in those days we'll have a couple of different buildings and in this building we have all the women in childbirth and quite often in another ward we'd have other people who needed things like limbs separating because of injuries or whatever. So our doctor would go into here and they'd work on these people and they'd saw an arm or a leg off to try and save a life and they were getting better. Most of this done was of course without any anaesthetic at all and the sign of a good surgeon was that he was quick and also the sign of a good surgeon was you could tell he was quick because of the amount of blood that he would actually have on his gown and they perhaps looked more like a, a butcher I suppose would be and you could tell a good surgeon because he'd have probably a lot more blood over him and that was a good sign of a good surgeon so this good surgeon would then trot across from where he'd been working to now do some childbirth and he'd help these ladies give birth to their little baby boys and girls and he'd then go back and do some more work here. Now what was of course happening is we had disease, contamination all here and the doctor the agent here would bring this across and 
he managed to get this on and in the mother and she died. What Ignaz Semmelweis decided to do was to try and put in the idea of washing hands. And he noticed that the medical students went straight from dissecting a dead body to delivering a baby without washing their hands and the women delivered by medical students and doctors rather than midwives were much more likely to cause a death and because the midwives seemed to see or be doing much better because they would only be dealing with the women over here so the midwife would only operate in this sphere that he came up with some ideas and he noticed that another doctor died from symptoms almost identical to childbirth fever when he cut himself whilst he was doing one of these dissections or working on the body. So he convinced all the medical students to wash their hands between working on the dead bodies and patients that needed work on and when they came over to give birth and it worked. Fewer mothers died from this um, childbirth fever but there were some problems. A lot of people, a lot of doctors didn't believe him because this was tried and trusted practice and when Ignaz Semmelweis left this hospital things reverted back to normal and the number of deaths from childbirth fever increased. So a bit of a sad story when he got it right but other people refused to listen to him. There were various other discoveries made at this time and these are sort of quite sort of useful discoveries. Another gentleman called Louis Pasteur, I have a picture of him here, he worked on the idea of these bacteria and what caused the problems. So Pasteur came up with a very interesting experiment to try and show that pathogens or microorganisms are available in the air. Now, until this time, people didn't believe that this was really true. There was some sort of life force in the air and it gave rise to disease and other things spontaneously. And Pasteur did an interesting experiment. He took a long tube connected to a bowl and in here he filled this up with soup and he left it. He took another one of these vessels which was exactly the same but what he then did he heated this tube up and he bent the glass because this is all made of glass and he made what's called a swan neck vessel. One of my ambitions is to try and actually create one of these sometime. But it appears more difficult and you can't buy this equipment. So, two identical setups. Both here open to the air so if there are any life forces in the air, then they can freely travel 
into both. But if this is due to microorganisms in the air, then the microorganisms are going to go down here and they're probably going to get trapped down here because there's no air in and out. So there's no reason for any of them to try and manage to climb up there. They can't climb anyway. They're just going to be carried by the air. And what he found was if he left this for a week or so, this broth became cloudy. And that was due to these microorganisms. And this stayed clear. And in this way, he tried to show that basically these microorganisms were the things that were getting in and therefore were the things that were causing diseases. There were quite a few ideas going around at this time and they were trying to look at a whole series of different sort of diseases and uh, what sort of things were going on and there were various people who came up with various ideas about what might be able to sort of cause it and what might be sort of able to protect it and we've got various other sort of heroes of the time coming in. We find that Louis Pasteur he also developed some vaccines and these are sort of popular at the moment this idea of what is a vaccine and he worked on two of them to solve a problem called anthrax can't spell anthrax and another one he worked on which was a major problem was rabies so Pasteur also came up with the idea of you may have heard of pasteurized milk pasteurization of basically heating things up to kill these microorganisms that were in the air causing all these problems Another famous doctor who did some work was a gentleman called Joseph Lister. And I've got a little picture of Lister here. So this is as he became Lord Joseph Lister. And what he got up to was working on some stuff called antiseptics. Joseph Lister was a doctor and he believed that there were these microorganisms and they got into the wounds and caused problems. So what he tried to do was to get rid of them. One of those that he used was iodine. And if we have a solution of iodine, and it's still used widely today, that a wound or an operation before an operation might be carried out, then sometimes you might have seen this sort of browny liquid rubbed over a wound before they sort of cut it open. I'm a great believer in a little dab of iodine. But it's got its side effects. It's quite dangerous. It can affect parts of the body. So we have to take some of these things with sort of a little bit of caution. You don't really want to get this iodine into your body. And we used to sort of put it on cuts and wounds when I was a child and now much less so. We have in fact 
much better antiseptics available to us now than was available at the time of Lord Joseph Lister's time when he was playing around with different antiseptics and he also came up with some ideas of trying to put these onto surfaces trying to clean surfaces down and we know that this does cause a problem let me tell you about this problem and this will take my son by surprise what I'm going to do is I'm just going to clean the surface and uh, let's see what goes wrong with cleaning my surface now no, I've, got I've got here, here my surface, surface and, and I've, I've left, left it all dirty, dirty and my son's just going to pass me uh, a nice uh, wet uh, cloth and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to clean the surface with this so I've got my nice wet cloth here and um, it's been around for a little while and uh, I, I've wiped some of the surfaces here with some of the bits and pieces and that, that's that's quite good and then I can leave this out to sort of dry and all these little microorganisms can fall on them and then I can get my cloth out and it's got all these microorganisms on them and then I can wipe these things round and I can clean up and wow a nice clean wonderful surface no problem except of course it isn't and what we need are some wonderful things like some kitchen cleaner now what's the difference between this because I can take my my dirty cloth with all my microorganisms on it and I can use it Nah, perhaps not. Um, what we're going to have is the other cloth, Paul, which is a, a clean one. And Paul's just going to rinse it for me. And this is where you're, we're seeing these noises off. And in comes now a clean cloth, which uh, was a bit wet. And what we can now do is wipe the surface down and we've got one of these chemicals in here and these chemicals are antiseptics and they're going to kill off all the germs microorganisms that might be down here and it's going to destroy them and they're gone of course, to finish this off, I can always take my towel that I have previously cleaned and then I wipe my hands in several times and left this to dry. Yep, this is full of bacteria as well. And this then doesn't make this particularly safe because we've got on here lots of invisible microorganisms which is why at the moment you're washing your hands regularly to try and get rid of any of these things and what we're also doing is we're wiping our hands in a one-time use cloth a paper towel so antiseptics are quite interesting sort of chemicals that we can actually use. Right, the next person I want to have a look at is a gentleman called Edward Jenner. Now, Edward Jenner was quite a famous doctor and <coughs> let's go and have a quick look at him. This is Edward Jenner and Edward Jenner listened to a lot of stories that were going around at his time 
and they were all to do with smallpox and a similar disease called cowpox. It looked the same, but cowpox came and it went and it was quite mild, didn't really affect any people. Smallpox, on the other hand, killed. And there are horrible pictures of people with smallpox, a terrible disease. So there was a story going around at the time that if you had cowpox, you didn't get smallpox. And so what Dr. Edward Jenner did, he investigated this to see what the truth was. And he got a boy. Now, I think if we did this nowadays, I think there might be a bit of problems, but those days it was acceptable. And what he did, he infected this boy with some cowpox. And sure enough, he got cowpox. Then a little while later, he infected the same boy with smallpox. Now I can just imagine this happening today and him getting thrown into prison and all sorts of various problems. But in those days he got away with it. It was perfectly acceptable. In fact the Parliament were very pleased with him because he came and presented this idea that he had a vaccine that by giving people cowpox then they wouldn't get smallpox and the government of the day thought this was an excellent idea and started the first vaccination program the vaccine wasn't just giving someone a disease it's something a little bit different let's have a look so what we're looking at in a vaccine well we take our disease and we basically we damage it so we take some damaged or destroyed or sometimes just crippled disease and we put that into a person so this is typically injected into them. So they don't get the proper disease, they get part of it, something that's damaged. In the case of a virus, the virus is made up from two bits. It's typically made up from a protein coat and a piece of DNA. If you only give them the protein coat with no DNA, then they're not going to get the disease. But what they will build up are in their system some sort of antibodies to this disease. And that should protect them. Now, whether it does or not, that's a different matter altogether. At the moment, we're suffering from COVID-19. And, for example, my parents have both managed to get COVID-19. One didn't survive, the other one has. And my mother, who survived, she, in theory, has now got antibodies to the coronavirus. Now, what happens if she goes out? Now, she's old, and she goes out and she meets someone with the coronavirus. Well, she'll get it like anybody else does. She'll pick up the virus, the virus will start to get into her body and start to wreak havoc. But she's already got antibodies to this. And so those antibodies set off an immune response and her body starts producing loads and loads of antibodies to this particular virus and it destroys it before it gets really anywhere. In fact since she's only had this 
several weeks, she might still have quite a lot of antibodies in her system anyway. So she's still likely to pick up the virus if she goes out. But in theory, theory, she can't get the disease. She can get, of course, the disease. That's not really in question. It's that she's got resistance to it and she will destroy it before it takes hold and has another go at trying to kill her. So, vaccines don't work the way that people think they work. You still get the disease. It's just that it manages to destroy them before you sort of die. You're in a battle, a constant battle. These infections are trying to get in. And how are they trying to get into your body? Well, they're going to try and get in through any opening they can. So we've got to worry about eyes we've got to worry about the nose we've got to worry about the mouth and what we put into our mouth and more importantly we've got to worry about what looks like cats there cuts so to get around all of these we're looking at hygiene now what sort of hygiene are we talking about? Well, we're talking about washing hands. And at the moment, there's a lot about washing hands. What is the most effective way to stop any sort of bug? And that's washing hands. You see, our problem is, I've just washed my hands and then I seem to touch my face, whatever I'm doing. And then anything that was transferred on my hands is transferred to my face, to my nose, to my mouth, to my eye. And that's where we're going to get things and problems into the body. Or worse, if I've got a cut and I manage to rub it in to my cut. So hand washing most important so wash your hands especially when you've been to the toilet I'm not doing well for spelling toilet we've got any time when you're going to do any cooking food preparation we do that any time you contact an animal yeah I've got a cat and I stroke it and it's lovely and it's friendly and it's one of the family and no you see once you've played with the cat you put the cat down then before you do anything else you've got to wash your hands I don't have a cat I don't have a dog I don't have a pet I get my next door neighbour's cat visiting that's about as much as I get but any time you touch the animal, then you wash your hands. And how many of you have got a pet and you play with them and then you do other things? Yeah, you know, I've seen people kiss their pets. Yeah. So if you're working with anyone who's got an infectious disease, then we need to basically wash our hands every time we've done something. What other things have we got to try and do this? Well we've looked at one of them. We've looked at the disinfectants. So I put a disinfectant on my work surface. So if we're going to do that and put it onto the work surface, yep yeah, that's it important place to sort of work because we're trying to get rid of the number of pathogens chemicals that work really well there bleach and as far as I know virtually nothing survives bleach 
I remember on a advert for a particular brand of bleach and it said that it kills 99% of all germs and that worries me because that means there's 1% that I have to worry about if it's not killed and it also said it killed 90% of all known germs how about the unknown ones big problem so we've got disinfectants to try and basically keep our work surfaces clean toilets are another good place yet in fact most people work harder on their toilets than anywhere else probably your toilet is one of the cleanest rooms in the house our next problem is with raw meat and cooked meat how many of you have a refrigerator and you've got both raw meat in there and cooked meat so we've got to make sure they're kept separate and we normally try to make sure that the cooked meat goes at the top and the raw meat at the bottom so if anything comes out of the raw meat and drips it's not going to drip on the cooked meat easier said than done our big problem nowadays with coronavirus is here that of coughing and sneezing coughing and sneezing well if you're going to do that then it's a good idea to do that into a handkerchief preferably a tissue a, a disposable one but if you can't then sometimes it's worthwhile sneezing then into probably not your hand that was where the idea of the handkerchief came from and the idea was not that you had your sort of I'm gonna sneeze and put it into your tissue but that you might actually <sighs> tissue into your hand and then wipe your hand with the tissue the handkerchief the idea of wiping your hand we now know that's a lot more dangerous one use tissues much much safer when you've used it then throw it away then what else you got wash these things wash your hands as soon as you or as soon as possible you can actually do something picking up these viruses picking up these bacteria fungal infections they're all around us in the air as Louis Pasteur showed us so coughing and sneezing then we need to use a tissue and then wash your hands how many people use a tissue and say oh well, I've used the tissue good that was it it isn't just a case of using disinfectants that we mentioned earlier on work surfaces but we need to think about general hygiene of people of machinery for doing all sorts of things anything sort of agricultural then we're trying to do things to prevent the spread of disease we see diseases like foot and mouth disease and when foot and mouth disease comes then we see all the farmers trying to disinfect their tools whatever they're using but how about the rest of the time just because there's a disease outbreak you know people start doing things like let's wash our hands 
But in fact, if there's something we can take away from the coronavirus pandemic that we've got at the moment is we wash our hands and we wash our hands regularly. Maybe every hour or so, wash your hands. Done something, wash your hands. Going to eat something, wash your hands. And that would not just stop the spread of coronavirus, but it would spread, stop the spread of all types of other diseases. Basically, washing yourselves, but washing all the things that you come into contact with. Don't use the cloth several times, but instead dispose of it. Rather than a kitchen cloth, is it better to use kitchen towel, grab that, clean with that, and then throw it away. I'm not a great fan of having a sort of a throwaway society. And you can see that people do scratch themselves quite naturally. People don't realise how much they rub their faces. It's quite interesting to just do that of a class. Just record a picture of a class. And at the end, play it back to them. And what we do is we highlight every time everyone touched their face. And in fact, everyone does it. And it's how many times they do that per hour. And if you've just got clean hands, and then having got your clean hands, you then put them down on a clean surface. What I've now got is a dirty hand, which I can now put all over my face. So I picked up these pathogens that are simply around in the air, that are on every surface like this. There are pathogens there. And if they go into me, then the chances are I can get something. We've got some systems here to try and prevent this happening. Your mouth goes to your stomach, which is full of acid, which tries to destroy most things but people still get sick so it doesn't work all the time and it doesn't work on everything very effectively we think of the system as an arms race so we can isolate people and we're calling the isolation at the moment around the world social distancing how much social distancing well let's say two meters and we stay two meters away from everyone but of course when the coronavirus finished we come out of lockdown then we can no we shouldn't and we shouldn't do that really anytime Perhaps what we learn from this is that when we leave this lockdown, social distancing stays with us. When I grew up, certain things were available on television. We watched television programmes. There weren't many, but there were some. And they're now not acceptable to watch some of those. They're not politically correct. They're not right. People don't do that these days. They don't say those things. They don't talk about those people like that anymore. And rightly so. But maybe you could talk to your children in years gone by and say, yeah, there were times when you would actually meet someone and you'd shake their hands. Oh! How awful to think that you'd shake someone you don't know, you don't know where they've been, you've got their hand, you've now picked up their germs, their microorganisms, their pathogens, and now you've got them. I remember those times when people did shake their hands. Now maybe we need to find a better way of doing things to keep up the social distancing not now during the lockdown, not just after the lockdown, but permanently, because that's going to stop the spread of not this infection, but 
all infections. It's a thought. If we've got vectors that move the disease, what? What's a, a vector? Well, we know of various vectors that carry diseases. We know about mosquitoes. They can carry malaria, dengue fever. The popular one in this country, house flies. Now, what are house flies like? Well, they like all sorts of things. And they might have just been walking on some excrement and the next thing they do is they fly into your house, they then walk on your surface. That's no problem. You then touch your surface. You've now picked up small parts of that faecal matter and it is amazing where faecal matter gets. It's really horrific to work out what it does. And now I've got faecal matter on my hands, which I picked up by touching the table, which I picked up from the fly, which landed on the table, having just landed on some excrement. And now that can be on me. So we've got house flies. Big problem house flies, something like about a hundred diseases carried by house flies. You may not just have some of those things, you may find that we've got aphids. Aphids, they carry diseases to the plants. We've got beetles carrying diseases to the plants. And if I can destroy my aphids, then they aren't going to get my plants infected. If I can destroy my houseflies, they aren't going to spread the diseases. If I can destroy the mosquitoes, then they're not going to spread things like malaria. Or worse, I suppose, than that one, dengue fever. If we can destroy the vectors, the spread of disease can be prevented. And if we can control the number of vectors, then the spread of the disease is going to be reduced dramatically. And we come back to vaccination. Oh no, we mustn't do vaccination. I've heard, well, Mrs. So-and-so said to my best friend's mates, dogs, aunties, whatever, that this vaccine wasn't very good. No, it caused all sorts of problems. It gave her... And it's not very good. It's dangerous. It can cause all sorts of problems. It can make you scratch. It can make you rub your eyes. It can make... What a load of rubbish. Yes, a few people do suffer from reactions to vaccines, sort of one in a million. But the chance of dying from a disease, very much higher. If we can vaccinate the population, then the diseases can't spread. We have this herd immunity. What our government in this country was hoping that we might be able to do at the start and then realise very quickly that we can't do that. Why not? Because so many people would have died first. And then you're left with a population that's safe. These diseases do spread around the world from time to time. The Black Death. It took a lot longer to spread around the world but it killed an enormous number of people. And unfortunately, people didn't understand vectors. They didn't discover it was being carried by rats. 
Instead, some people thought it was going to be destroyed, carried by cats, so they killed a lot of the cats. And that had the effect there were more rats and the disease spread better. Some villages tried to isolate themselves, and it worked for a time. But when they went out to the main population, they still met people, even years later, who were not who were not had the disease. We do get some people that are naturally resistant to the disease. They don't show any symptoms. They still may have it, but they don't respond in the same way. And that's the problem. A microorganism, by its name, is very, very small. It can't be seen. Due to this man, Pasteur, he showed that these little microorganisms were in the air. They're being carried in the air all the time. We breathe them in. And if we think about how our nose works, we can see why our nose works quite effectively. If I were to look at an average person's nose, and here we have your average person's nose, the air goes up and then down. And as it changes its path, then we have hairs here to try and prevent particles getting in, and we've got sticky mucus here, and much of the pathogens are going to stick here. And then, instead of going down into the lungs, they can go down into the stomach, where they can be destroyed. If they're in the lungs, then you need to have and find a way of trying to destroy this microorganism. So the idea of a vaccination is that we have a small bit of something that's basically harmless of the particular bug. So perhaps just its protein coat, just a bit of the wall of the bacteria, something of the fungus that our body can then identify and once it's identified it can then detect it later on and it can destroy it before it gets going but rather than cure prevention is the key prevention is much better than cure curing coronavirus some people are okay, some people have flu-like symptoms, some people need ventilation just to keep them going long enough that they can bring in their immune system to f defend themselves because if they don't do that in time, then they die. And that can happen to all sorts of people, those especially who've got problems with whatever this particular disease is going to target. Coronavirus targets the lungs, a sort of pneumonia. Other diseases do other things. And so although we might moan at a government for saying, you haven't got enough ventilators, it could have been a different disease that could have affected the digestive system. It could have been something that affects the nervous system in which case then a ventilator wasn't what we needed, but we might need something else instead. Prevention is what this is all about, trying to prevent a infection taking hold. So, you have to stay safe. How do you stay safe? Well, the government says stay alert. And that's much better than staying at home. 
staying alert we know that these things are around the air not just coronavirus which might be transferred if you're close to someone by a sneeze and a cough but how often have you seen anyone sneeze and cough I've got a sneeze into my arm it's much better than putting it into your hands coughing put it into your arm again and you don't tend to greet people with your your arm we need to wash our hands far more regularly and I would include with that one washing your face as well because if I've just gone and put some stuff on my face it's now on my face and I would wash my face more often but it's my hands that go everywhere hands are the real key wash your hands regularly always when you've been to the toilet always before you're going to come into contact with food whether that's preparing it or eating it my mother always told me to go and wash my hands before dinner standard practice do you do that every time and we know we don't how about hand sanitizer that's a good idea yeah it works on some things and not on others washing your hands it works on some things and not on others so some bugs some pathogens need more treatment than others but washing hands soap and water wonderful invention some of the soaps are called antiseptic soaps from Joseph Lister helps kill things wipe down all the surfaces how often regularly Your house should be clear, clean. The floor should be clear, clean. Your clothes should be washed regularly. Kills the pathogens. How about something that's in the wardrobe? Yeah. Pathogens have settled on that. So, wash clothes regularly. If you stored it, wash it before you wear it. I'm going to be popular, aren't I? Hygiene, so important. So, with that thought in your mind, go and wash your hands when you've washed, watched this. But before you do that, click the subscribe button and I will see you next time when we'll look at more about viral and bacterial infections. Stay safe. Goodbye.